In this chapter, it's all about one single compound. This compound is so integral to the fabric of life on Earth that scientists who are looking for life on other planets start by looking for this particular compound. The CD Institute is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And if you haven't guessed it, the molecule I'm talking about is good old H2O. And the compound is water. Here are our learning objectives. And to begin, I want to talk about sharing. Not like these guinea pigs, though I think the one on the left is going to be getting a little more carrot than the one on the right. And speaking of unequal sharing, one of these molecules shows unequal sharing of electrons. Which one is it? It's this one on the right here. Kind of subtle, but yeah, you, you can tell. Those are different shapes. And what do we call unequal sharing of electron pairs? Unequal sharing of electron pairs is called a polar covalent bond. And unequal sharing means that one part of the molecule feels a little electron naked while the other parts have more electron shielding. In other words, there are partial positive charges and partial negative charges around the molecule. We indicate that partial charge with a lowercase Greek letter delta plus for partial positive charge and for the lo a lowercase delta minus for a partial negative charge. So you can see I put those on this uh, molecule here, partial positive, partial negative. The element oxygen is greedy for electrons, or more scientifically, we say that oxygen is strongly electronegative. Only one element on the periodic table is more electronegative than oxygen, and that's fluorine. But that's not really biologically important. Compared to the other three Chon elements, oxygen is typically making a grab for those electrons, which makes water a polar molecule and which generates partial charges. These partial charges attract each other, not within the same molecule, but between molecules. These attractive forces are called hydrogen bonds, and they are weaker than covalent or ionic bonds, but again, small does not mean unimportant. Because water is a polar molecule that hydrogen bonds to charged molecules, water has four emergent properties that make life possible. The first half of this chapter will focus on how water molecules interact with each other, and how these interactions are essential for life on our planet, and also explain why there is no life on any other planets in our solar system. Probably. Wink. Okay, cohesion and adhesion. Water sticks to itself, and it sticks to other things. When things stick to themselves, we call that cohesion. Think of a cohesive unit as being something that sticks together well. And sticking to other things is adhesion. Think of an adhesive, like a glue, sticking to things that are different to each other. And both of these are important for life. For example, a tree can move water from its roots up through the trunk and out into the limbs and leaves with zero mechanical parts. No pumping. Air currents around the leaves pull water out, which pulls on the water in the leaves and so on all the way down into the roots. It's kind of like the wind is sucking on a million tiny straws that are in the leaves. The water molecules cohere to each other and adhere to the walls of the cells that conduct the water upward against gravity. Cohesion of water molecules also generates surface tension. The surface tension isn't great enough to act as a permanent barrier in many cases, though it does enable this water strider to stay above water. The hydrogen bonds in water also make it a great moderator of heat. What is heat? It's a form of energy. Uh, while you may think of heat and temperature as being the same thing, they are not. 
Both are measures of the kinetic energy, or the energy of movement, of molecules. Heat is a measure of the total kinetic energy of all the molecules in a sample. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules in a sample. Here is an example to demonstrate the difference. A swimming pool and a hot cup of black coffee. Yum. One of them has greater temperature and one of them has greater heat. Which one is which? So a hot cup of coffee has greater temperature while the swimming pool full of not quite so hot water has greater heat just because there's more stuff there, more molecules, uh, so a higher total kinetic energy. So heat is a type of energy which is usually measured in calories. A calorie is defined as the amount of energy required to increase one gram of water uh, by a temperature of one degree Celsius. When you look at the calorie information on a box of food, for some reason the calories that they say on there are actually kilocalories or a thousand calories each. So if a box says something is 40 calories, it's really 40,000 calories in the other sense. Uh, another interesting thing about heat that we should know is that even though we normally express heat energy in calories or kilocalories, the typical SI unit for energy is joules. So we can convert joules to calories, though it's not something we're, I'm not going to, don't worry about it too much. Just know that uh, calories and joules are interconvertible because heat is a form of energy. Specific heat is a physical property of matter, and it is the amount of heat necessary to change the temperature of a material. Because of hydrogen bonding, water molecules are sticky and resist changes in temperature. Metals, by contrast, have a low specific heat. Think of what happens if you put an empty pot on the stove and turn it on. It gets hot really, really quickly. But what happens if you go to make a pot of spaghetti? It takes a few minutes for that pot of water to go from room temperature around 22 degrees Celsius to boiling 100 degrees Celsius. And the reason it takes time is because water is resisting that change in temperature. Let's see. Look at those water molecules dancing around. So why is this so important of li for life? Because water has a high specific heat, water moderates temperature very well. If we look at this map of Southern California, what patterns do you observe? Where is the temperature higher? Where is it lower? So just take a second here and hypothesize what causes these patterns and predict what would happen, say, as day transitions to night. And what does this have to do with life on Earth? When you have taken science classes in the past, you have probably learned about the phases of matter and their properties. Gases are the least dense, then liquids, and solids are the most dense. This is usually true. But if you've ever had an iced drink, which you probably have, have you noticed that the solid water, also known as ice, where it sits in your drink, it floats. Many people think that this is because there are air bubbles trapped inside that ice that give the ice buoyancy, but that's not it. Ice floats because it is less dense than the cold water that surrounds it. As with all of the other characteristics of water, this is because of hydrogen bonding. As water transitions from liquid to solid, the hydrogen bonds become stabilized and at a distance that is, on average, greater than the distance between water molecules in the liquid phase. Why is this important for life? When I say that water is essential for life, I mean liquid water, not ice and not steam. When water freezes during the winter months, there is usually a layer of liquid water underneath that allows life to persist like the shrimp in this picture. If ice sank, it would make seasonal transitions take much longer 
and make conditions inhospitable for life. While water resists changes in temperatures, it is very good at dissolving compounds quickly. A chemical solution is a uniform mix of two or more substances. That uniform part is important. It consists of a liquid called the solvent and something that may start out as a liquid, but which is dissolved in the solvent and becomes a solute. Water is a great polar solvent as long as the solutes are either polar or charged. Uh, quick question. What is the name for a charged atom or ion, uh, atom or molecule in a solution? Oh, I nearly gave it away. It's an ion. Okay, so table salt, sodium chloride, is very stable when dry. If you have a container of table salt, it will sit there for ages on the shelf without any change. But add some salt to your food, stir it up, and where does all that crunchy salt go? It dissolves. Uh, table salt dissolves very well in water because the sodium and chloride ions break away from the crystallized salt grains and those cations and anions become surrounded by the partial charges of the water molecules. As you can see in the illustration, sodium cations become surrounded by the partial negative charges on water molecules, the red oxygen bits, and the chloride anions become surrounded by the partial positive charges on water molecules, the white hydrogen bits. This surrounding of a charged particle by water molecules is called a hydration shell. And once formed, the sodium and chloride ions are hindered from interacting again until the water goes away. What if we had a great big molecules, hundreds, thousands, millions of Daltons in size? Remember what a Dalton is? Will it dissolve in water? If there are partial or full formal charges on that molecule, the answer is yes. Look at the big purple blob in this image. It represents a large molecule like a protein. More on that in chapter five. But the outside of this big molecule, and of course big is relative, uh, is st studded with all kinds of charges. That's what you see over here in the little detail. Because of the partial charges on the molecule, uh, we can form a hydration shell and dissolve it. One kind of molecule that water is not good at dissolving is the nonpolar molecule. You may have heard the expression that oil and water don't mix. The reason why oil and water don't mix is because oil is nonpolar. Compounds that dissolve in water are either uh, ionic or polar, and they're called hydrophilic, which means water loving. Substances that repel water are typically nonpolar and are called hydrophobic or water fearing. Whether molecules are hydrophilic or hydrophobic is very important in cells, which have a lot of water inside of them. For those hydrophilic substances that may dissolve in water to make solutions, I need to say a little bit more. Amounts of things matter. If I were to bake a cake, which is a thing I like to do from time to time, I measure out the ingredients to make sure that the cake is consistent and, well, edible. If I were to just guess at the ingredients, I would probably make an inedible awful cake. What do I need, like 30 eggs, a teaspoon of flour, two cups of salt, a grain of sugar? So fixing amounts through a recipe is essential. And the same is true for solutions. So how do we do that when atoms and molecules are so infinitesimally small? We can do that by using the periodic table, which gives us the atomic masses, the little decimal numbers under the atomic symbol. Notice that there are no units. Yikes, that's not supposed to be that like that. Is that correct? Yes, yes it is. It is actually two things. For example, 12.011 is the average mass of an atom of carbon. 12.011 Daltons per atom. Most atoms are 12 Daltons, but every so often, very rarely, you get an atom that's 13 Daltons, or even more rarely, 14 Daltons. So on average, 12.011. This doesn't do as much good at the macro scale because you won't find a scale that measures Daltons. Enter the mole. I don't mean the animal. 
or a spy or a skin condition or a delicious sauce. I mean the number, one mole. Just like a couple means two and a dozen means 12, a mole is a word that means a number of something. That number is also called Avogadro's number here after this guy, the chemist Amadeo Avogadro. Uh, and this number is useful because it's conversion factor. Avogadro figured out exactly how many atomic mass units are equal to one gram. It's this many down here. 6.0221415 times 10 to the 23rd, or 6 with 23 zeros behind it, which is a mind-bendingly big number. That, so 1 million has 6 zeros, 1 billion has 9 zeros, 1 trillion has 12 zeros, so a mole is just under a trillion trillion, or 600 billion trillion, which, what even is that? So, back to this unitless number problem, which is really a unitless number solution. 12.011 is just the number of Daltons per atom of carbon, but it's also the number of grams per mole. Who cares? Well, anyone who actually wants to measure how much carbon you have in a sample empirically. Not just carbon, any compound. We have scales that can measure in grams. So we can use the atomic masses to calculate the molecular mass of a mole of a compound of interest. If we know the molecular formula for sucrose, which is table sugar, because yes, there's plenty of kinds of sugar not found on tables, we can calculate the molar mass. So the formula for sucrose is C12H22O11. So we take the atomic mass of carbon, 12.011, multiply times 12 atoms, 22 times the atomic mass of hydrogen, and 11 times the atomic mass of oxygen. Uh, we know the average molecule of sucrose weighs 342 Daltons per molecule. Then we kind of wave Avogadro's number over it and razamafu. We know that 342 grams of sucrose is one mole, or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Just how mind-blowingly big is a mole? Here is a short video to help us out with that.